two minutes uh, later. So I, I propose that we start and uh, I believe and expect more people to join in, but um, I know that we have quite an interesting discussion today, quite a lot to um, exchange on and to learn. And so for that reason, I propose that we can start and then the rest can be able to join us. So with that, a warm welcome to you all. And to start by way of introduction, I'm Catherine, a Master of uh, Arts in International Relations and Diplomacy student in the SALT Institute. I will be uh, the moderator for today. And I'm conscious of the fact that uh, we have participants who are um, joining from all over the continent, uh, Africa, but also from across the globe and uh, especially or with a special mention of our speaker for, for this uh, evening. So to all of you, I say welcome. Today's seminar is going to be not only exceptionally cap cap captivating, but also eye-opening. I invite you to, in the next two hours, actively engage our very seasoned and richly experienced guest, guest speaker. Considering we're all scattered in different parts of the globe, it is without doubt necessary to think global without prejudice, or maybe I should say without undermining the fact that we are based in a local environment. I not only hope, but also pray that you are as eager as I am to gather more insight on how to think global while acting local and more specifically, the relevant leadership in the 21st century, which is the title of our seminar today. And before I pass over to one of the students to start us in a word of prayer, I would like to acknowledge the very able um, Salt Institute management, all the dedicated students who are joining us today, as well as the participants uh, joining us today, and most especially a, a special acknowledgement and um, appreciation of our speaker for this evening. And please allow me to today uh, to extend the acknowledgement in a special way and appreciate all the women in the meeting. Happy International Women's Day. And uh, of course, to all men who are supporting these women, you're welcome to celebrate the day as well. And um, so with that, I know I now hand over to one of the SALT Institute students to open us with a word of prayer. Please, Kobena uh, Osei Ajekum, kindly unmute yourself and uh, lead us in a word of prayer and then we can start. Good Please, Kobena, we are, you're breaking, we're not getting you, or maybe it's only me. I'm not hearing you if you're speaking. Uh, Catherine. Yes, please. The, please go ahead, Kobena, yeah. and uh, lead us in a heart of prayer. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for such a wonderful day. You bless us with a lot of things. And Father, as we are alive, we commit each and every individual in this platform into your care. Father, we commit our best into your care. Give us open our hearts, minds, and brains that whatever we are going to learn today, or whatever is going to be imparted onto us, be able to account for whatever we have to Jesus Christ to pray with us and resting in Hello? Amen. 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 Thank you, uh, Amen. Bena, for the prayers. Uh, although my connection or your connection was not very stable, but thank you so much. Uh, God has had our prayers, and indeed, I trust and believe for a successful and very 
uh, interesting discussion in the next two hours. So with that, and I uh, once again acknowledge and appreciate all those who are joining us. I would like to pass the floor to one of uh, our students who is going to introduce our guest speaker for tonight, for this evening. And um, Ruki, I can see you already unmuted. Would you kindly go ahead and introduce our guest speaker for this evening? Thank you. To, to our Honorable Ambassador. Labu, management. Hello. Yes, Ms. Ruki, I can hear you. Uh, please go ahead with the with the introduction. Hello. Fellow court members, distinguished guests, a pleasant evening to you all. I am Ruki Kobi, a court two student of the leadership and management faculty. I have the honor to introduce the guest speaker for tonight. The guest speaker is a leadership and management professor at the Wittabo University, La Cruz, Western USA. He designs and teaches leadership courses, including meaningful, ethical, and practical servant leadership and mission vision and virtues of organization. He is a leader and a management consultant and a civic educationist. Our speaker has a 22 year progressive academic and career experience spanning from media practitioner, international community development consulting, research fellow, manager in the corporate world, among others, to a present traditional university professor. He is an author of five books, including Leadership is Concept Heavy, A Case Against Fragmented, fragmented Theories in Evolutionary and Contemporary Leadership, Counting the Count in Business Consulting, Ideation of top 40 business consultants, political party followership, and political leadership in Africa. Hands on teaching and evidence based learning in Africa and servant leaders. The greatest among us from research to practice. That is it. Sorry, that is why he has been appointed as the global ambassador for SALT Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, join me welcome our guest speaker for tonight, Professor Enoch Opoku Enchi. You are welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Roki Kobe, and then Catherine yes, sir. for all the wonderful introductions. Uh, I'm humbled by that. I'm a servant leader, so I do my work in secret. Uh, and all the participants, I want to welcome you to this series. I also want to say good evening to His Excellency Dr. Kojo Alabo and uh, Dr. Fatima Alabo and then Dr. Wa and Ernest Otin. All of them have made this event. And of course, uh, Mr. Ama, the registrar, you've all made this possible. So today I'm going to talk about thinking global and acting local, relevant leadership in the 21st century. That's what I'm going to talk about. Now, I know I can see you by hands. If you raise up your hand that I, I can know a lot about that. How many of you have heard about the word GLOCAL? G-L-O-C-A-L, GLOCAL. When you raise up your hand, I can see that. Yes, GLOCAL means thinking global acting local. So Frank Kujo has heard about that. Yes, uh, I've seen you, Catherine, you've heard about that. If you raise up your hand, I will see you. So I can mention your name. This is gonna be like a typical classroom where I can see you and then we have a lofty discussion. 
So that is exactly what we're going to talk about, how to think global and then act local, relevant leadership in the 21st century. Now, my university is Viterbo University at La Crosse, Wisconsin, USA. We have the only master's program in the entire world in seven leadership. So let me make it start this way. When Peter Drake, one of the top management gurus, asked a question that what motivates people to go into leadership, he never had the answer until 1971, where Robert Greenleaf gave him the answer. Two things that motivates an individual to go into leadership. One is personal and two is situational. So personal reasons could motivate somebody to go into leadership and then the situation calls for certain kinds of leadership. So let's see how that works. This is my preamble. There are many people who have been raised in many horrible circumstances and they have chosen to rise above their circumstance and become excellent leaders. And they have been beneficial to the world and then their families. And there are also many people who had a very privileged childhood and advantage yet chose to live a very shameful life. So some of us have been handed that kind of easy baton and others will have to struggle to live. But either way, think about the voice that you hear that has called you to lead as a leader because you're thinking about relevant leadership in the 21st century. So let's look at the 20th century and then the 21st century, the difference. In the 20th century, there was vertical leadership, top down, chain of command. We remember Fayol and all those people, span of control, control information. And then we talk about knowledge is power, but look at what has transformed in the 21st century. We have moved from vertical leadership to horizontal leadership where we have reduced hierarchy, emphasize on collaboration instead of competition, focus on coordination, we share information, and then we create new knowledge. So that is a picture of where we have now. If you go to Japan and most Asian countries, the organizational structure is very flat because you don't have that kind of tall organizational structures anymore. We are living in a world of organic instead of mechanistic situation, and then we share resources and coordinate and then unlock potential. So every organization is looking for what's the next big idea. So think about the ideas instead of span of control. And then how do we create knowledge in the 21st century? Larry Ellison, who is the, uh, was the CEO of Oracle said is that it's a dangerous world out there. We had this amazing 10 year period in the 2000s when we pretended it wasn't. We all know that Recently, it's difficult for even students to concentrate. We have this Ukraine-Russia thing. We have the pandemic of COVID-19. And then we have gas prices, petrol prices rising up because of what is happening in Ukraine. And a whole lot of things thrown in. And it's difficult to concentrate. But we also cannot gross over that we are part of history. Because 30, 50 years down the lane, people are going to see TVs and see our generation having a mask on our mouth. And they will be asking questions. What were these guys doing? And if you are still alive at that time, you will say that at that time we had something called COVID-19. We had to cover our noses so that we would not die. So even though we're going through difficult times, we're also part of history. Now, how do we understand the global leadership concept? Let's look at some of the research. We conducted a study with 1,500 CEOs, and we found a couple of things that I want to discuss the insight with you. Realize that one, we have shortage in global leadership capability. That's, that's a fact that leadership, we need leaders everywhere because leadership permeates in every institution from the police service to the military, to politics, to homes, to the churches, everywhere, even in parliament, we need leadership there. The judiciary, we need leadership there. And there is also a shift in competitive dynamism. Then we have what we call the symptomatic character of globalization. So we see whether globalization is the problem or we have other flaws that is taking care. So look at the data here by region. We look at Europe, North America, China, and then India and realize that the top thing that they are all looking for is management or leadership. That is number one. And followed by it, we have research and development or product development people. And then we have strategic thinkers, then sales, operations, information technology, marketing, finance, and the human resources in that order. So you can see that in all these places that we did the interview, we are looking for leaders in many organizations. 
So that is highlighted over there. So let's see from 1965 to now, the idea that people are looking for competitive intensity. Everybody is looking for absolute or comparative advantage. When we talk of absolute advantage, it means that you have absolute control of production of the resource distribution and everything. But when we talk about competitive advantage, it means that you, in a way, can do it better than other countries. Because when we talk about best watches, we're looking at Switzerland. When we talk about best shoes, we're looking at Italy. So any country or organization have something that they do especially better than others. Now, you know that in these lines, we have the labor productivity, which is the blue line, which we are also looking for. I've told you that already the green line, which is at the top, the competitive intensity, that's what everybody's looking for. Return on the asset and then topple rate is lower on that line. So National Public Radio do something great. Uh, they look for best books, best selling books, and I talk about it, and the best researchers and also talk about that. And they talk about this book, In Search of Excellence, by Tom Peters and Robert Waterman. So when you are a leader, you search for excellence. And I can tell you that in searching for excellence, there's no growth in your comfort zone. So anytime you are becoming comfortable in a place, it means that you are not growing out there. Now, is global the issue? No, complexity is rather the issue. So what is causing the complexity, interdependence? America's population of about 380 million is just 4% of the world population. But guess what? Americans alone put, consumes 25% of the world resources. It means that without the rest of the world, Americans cannot live. So we are all interdependent on the others. We all know about the war in Ukraine, what it has caused to gas prices. You know, so interdependent because most of Europe, even Germany, they depend on gas from Russia, about 60% of their supply. So you can see that kind of interdependence that when something happened in the other part of the world, it affects all of us. Then diversity is also an issue. We live in a very diversified world. We don't look the same. We don't talk the same. We don't reason the same. And that is the beauty of our world. Then ambiguity, nothing is straightforward. Sometimes you put a lot of thinking into it and you can't find a solution. So these three, Interdependent issue, diversity, and ambiguity causes what we call the flux. And the flux has become more important than global issues. So former CEO of BMW says that the world is not getting smaller, it is getting faster. And that's true. That has put more pressure on the fast flux. We all live in a world where people want fast food, fast report, everything is fast. And that means you need to be very fast in living in a complex world. So let's see some of the things we need in living in the flux of our world. You need to be discovering, you need to be a system thinker, you need to be more collaborative instead of thinking about competition. Remember, African education has all been competition. Who is first, who is second, who is third? But the worst education is not like that. It's about collaboration, group work, teamwork, which is very important. Because the more we share ideas, the more we get to know more. We know Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, he wasn't a, your, you know, your kind of typical politician. He was a comedian. And people are saying that the situation now has made him a leader because you, you have been in a situation where your leadership and you have to come around. And let me also share with you a personal journey that when I was young, I thought I knew a lot. But the more I grew up and I started learning and learning and learning, attending conferences and delivering, you know, at many events and other people also speaking at many events, I realized that I know nothing. And that really humbled me. The more we learn, the more we realize that we know nothing. So we will never stop learning. And if you are a student now, you have that opportunity to learn from every situation that you find yourself. And then architecting is really important as a construct in the 21st century leadership. So let's see the what I talk about, the CEOs that we interview, we interview 1,541 CEOs and general managers and senior public sector global leaders. And I share the data with you. So the insight is really simple. Now, if you look at that inside the CEOs, three things that I've categorized, we have how do we embody creative leadership? And here, the ideas we came out is that you have to embrace ambiguity, take risks that disrupt legal or legacy business models, and live from beyond tried and true mega management styles. Most of the management styles that have been existing are old now and are molded. You need to try new things. You have to be very creative. Then we also had this subtopic of reinventing customer relationship, which is really important. 
in the 21st century. So you have to honor your customers about all else, use two-way communication system, avoid the background noise, and then profit from information explosion. Now, the last one here is building operating dexterity. And in doing that, you have to simplify whenever possible. Keep it simple and sweet and short. And then manage systematic complexity, promote the mindset of being fast and flexible. And then the word that we are using today, be global. Think global, but act local. Why is this important? Because you look at a global landscape, what is going on, but you have to be somebody who uses global ideas to solve local problems. Your locality in Africa, we have many problems which we have to fix locally. How do we use the global ideas to fix our local problems so that we can change our own world? That is very important. So the key here is what I've underlined. Be comfortable with ambiguity and then have the courage to drop outdated approaches. And then make sure you take what we call the balance risk, which is very important. These three things I want you to remember. And then be open-minded and inventive. These are key constructs I want you to learn in the 21st century. Be comfortable with ambiguity. Be thinking about how you encourage others to drop outdated approaches. And then be open-minded and take balanced risk. Now, in doing that, I've also underlined this. 61% of leaders say that they tend to persuade and influence rather than to command and control. People want to be reminded rather than be controlled. So learn that. Try to persuade people instead of trying to use your commanding system. We have this guy, uh, Jim, Jeff Thompson, talk about something that is important. He said that I always want to use my personal power instead of my positional power. Anytime you are using your positional power that because I'm the CEO, I'm the manager, and you are using your positional power, it means that you've lost your personal power. Always use your personal power, your integrity, your authenticity. Use these powers to convince people about your capabilities instead of using your position that because I am this, you have to do that. It doesn't help in the 21st century. So stop thinking about the command and control and persuade people to do things for you. Now, let's understand global leaders. How do we define the phenomenon and what has been the research done in that area? So when we talk about global leadership, it's just a way of influencing the thinking attitudes and behaviors of our communities. So personal issues come here. And we all know the theories of change. If you want to change any theory or organization, you change the individual first. So think about attitudes and behaviors of the global community and how you can synergistically help towards a common vision to solve a community problem. So we have Alan Bird. He came out with these different definitions of it, positive change, building communities, uh, development of trust, and arrangement of organizational structures, and then the context involving multiple stakeholders. Everybody is a stakeholder. They all have interest in developing our communities. And how do we work with the trust deficit? Now I've seen that politicians are becoming an indigenous species. People don't trust politicians again. They think they are liars. But I think that it's not everybody who is in politics who is a liar. So the trust deficit is too much. And how do we solve it in the 21st century? Because in Africa, politics and sports are really huge when we come to the 21st century of leadership. So some conditions are temporal and geographical and cultural. Cultural is really one of the important things. This morning I was doing a lecture of system thinking and asking my student about International Day of Women. What do we do about the bias towards women? And somebody, one of the students shared something passionately. She said growing up, her mother has been the breadwinner of the house. The mother works, you know, has a bigger job, and the father does anything that he has to do, stay home, fixing the buildings and, and the yards and all those things. That's what she grew up knowing. Now she grows up, she's getting to marry, and then the husband wants her to stay home and be a stay-home mama. She don't want to do that because she grew up in a culture where mother was taking care of the family. And now I ask her, what do you do to help your fiancé so that you can grow together as a family. And she said, I've never thought about that. So yes, culture is really key in even the biases we have against women in the 21st century. Let's find a way to fix that. So these are all the empirical research that have been done uh, on global leadership in the 21st century. You can take a look at them after my presentation and ask questions. Now, according to Remy Smith, he talked about the global mindset. 
And you can see that the global mindset talks about the cognitive, the brain part, the intellectual part, the business acumen, that's all the paradox of management. And then you need a global behavior. Behavior is really key because your attitude is your altitude. Your attitude can take you anywhere you want to go. So if you have the right kind of attitude, then you can be wherever you want to be and then wherever you want to be. Uh, John McCain, who is a former senator, and he contested for President of America, said that your character is your destiny. And I think I agree with him on that. Emotional intelligence is also a piece that we can throw in there, how to manage your own feelings and then the feelings of others in organization. So these are the constructs you have to learn. And then Brick talk about a global triad of leadership. He talk about change agent. You have to be a change agent, how to build a community and cross-cultural communication, which is important. And then when you talk about personal effectiveness, how do you account, become accountable to yourself and then your community and then curiosity in learning and how do you become matured in anything that you do and thinking agile. And then business acumen, he talked about death of the field, entrepreneurial spirit, and then stakeholders orientation, and then how astute you are. Then he also talked about global explorer, which is how do you demonstrate that you are serving in technology, in critical thinking, and all these constructs that we are looking for. And how do you exhibit that character? Because it is important to have a good character but how do you show it in an exhibition that people will know that you are like this or you are like that? Remember in leadership, there's a difference between formal leadership and informal leadership. The formal leadership is what we see at the workplace. But informally, do you know what the people do in their closed doors? And unfortunately, we don't have many yardsticks to measure informal part of leadership. We measure the formal part because when we're talking about service and everything, people will tell you, what they exhibit, not what they do behind closed doors. But when we talk about culture, it is what we do when nobody's watching us. So look at 12 dimensions of global leadership from Kets D. Vres. He's a Dutch guy. Visioning, empowering, energizing, designing, aligning, rewarding, and feedback, and then team building, outside orientation, global mindset, tenacity, emotional intelligence, life balance, and then resilience to stress. Balance is really a key in 21st century leadership because we live in a world of complexity. You know, you have to know how to balance your work and then family, make sure that you exercise, make sure that you eat well. These all help to reduce your stress to make you a really global icon. Because guess what? Steve Covey said that you have to iron the sword. If you don't sharpen your sword as a leader, you don't take care of yourself, how do you take care of your organization if you're sick? If mentally you can't think right, how do you take care of that organization? So Rosen also came out to global literacies that we all have to know. Personal literacies, business literacies, and then social literacies, and then cultural literacies. Remember that some people are self-ignorant. Some people have gone to, have attained a lot of education, but how to apply practically, they have a problem. And because they are illiterate in some areas. So let's talk about personal literacy, a graphic insight. You have to gain insight about something before you talk about that. Do you know why all the media, most of our media in Africa is all about sensationalism and we are not educating and informing people about, about entertainment? Because our people like entertainment. They don't like insight. So everybody is talking about this, that, naked pictures, and you see within two hours, 250 views. But talk about educational things and then how many people want to listen to that? And people don't want to do that. They are all looking for shortcut to make money, shortcut to make money. But that's not how the world works. And the media have created that kind of negative influence that we all have to work in fixing. Then confident humility. Confident humility is key, personal literacy, authentic flexibility, reflective defensiveness, decisiveness, and then realistic optimism. When you are optimistic, you have to be realistic about what you are capable of doing and what you are not capable of doing. What about the business literacy? Let's talk about chaos negotiator. Two things that define me as a person. I'm very open and collaborative, but two things that I don't like, drama and confusion. But you know that some leaders thrive in confusion. Yes, there are some leaders when there's chaos, uh, they thrive well there. And a typical example is Donald Trump. Yes, some people when there's confusion, when there's drama, yes, they, they do well because that is their style. So you have to know how to deal with that. And in leadership, I advise you that in your weakness, you have somebody to complement that kind of weakness. So let's say you are terrible in math. You have somebody who is really good in math.
to complement your weakness. If you are not good in computers as a leader, hire somebody who is good in computers to be your vice president or you know, your vice manager so that that person can complement your weakness. And then you have to be futuristic and what we call the leadership liberator, then economic integrator. The social literacy means that you have to build a pragmatic trust, agent listening. It's not everybody who listen. Most people listen to give you a feedback. It means they are not listening to you. They've already formed opinion about you and they give that kind of feedback. That's not what we are looking for. And then we have constructive impatience, then connective teaching and collaborative individualism. When we talk about cultural literacy, be proud of your roots. In fact, God is wisdom make you a black person. Black is beautiful. Be black and bold, learn all that you can because when you have that, everybody will listen to you when you speak. Be proud of who you are. God made you who you are in his wisdom. Be proud of that and carry it along with you anywhere you go. In fact, I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. So I can tell you from all my travels that it's really important to be confident in your skin and appreciate how God created you. So I've given all that here in what Macau and Hollenberg talk about competencies in global executiveness. And you can look at open-mindedness and being flexible in thought and tactics, cultural interest and sensitivity, being able to deal with complexity issues, resilient, resourceful, optimistic, and energetic. Honesty and integrity is everything. Please make sure you are impeccable with your words. Always make sure you are impeccable with your words. You have to have a stable personal life and then value other technical and business skills. We live in a world of technology. So think about being sufficient in technology, in your managerial work, and then in your personal work. At least know the basics about computers. It's going to help you. I've also listed all the global leadership competencies that we are looking for. Visioning, inspiring, articulating, all these things. You, when you get a chance, I've given a PowerPoint to the registrar. You can have access to it and then look at that. Now, another research that Jacqueline talk about the synthesis of global leader competencies. So you talk about layers of competencies, behavioral skills, socially, networking skills, because your network is your net worth. Please, your network is your net worth. Africa is one of the places that even if you don't know anybody or nobody knows, you, getting a good job is a problem, especially from the public sector. Most of the job that you see advertised is already given to somebody. So make sure that you broaden your network. Get somebody to mentor you so that you can have that kind of a broadened network because getting a degree might not be enough in Africa as it is in Europe or North America. Because here, when you apply for any job, about 550 people are applying for the same job. But your competency and your rich experience is going to get you the job. Nobody's biased in, you know, interview for a job here in the West. But in Africa, it's a different thing. Sometimes some people don't even go to interviews. Because they know somebody, they are given that kind of job. And that is why you have to get that kind of behavioral skills. That's going to help you. The mental characteristic, be very optimistic, self-regulation, motivate yourself. So have that kind of intrinsic motivation. Have a very accurate social judgment skills. And then empathy, be an empathetic thinker. And then build your cognitive skills by reading. Make sure at least you read about 15 minutes every evening before you sleep. When you feel that you want to sleep and the sleep demon will not touch you, all that you have to do is to pick a textbook, try to read it, and guess what? You will have all, at least a knowledge 15 minutes before you sleep. And then the fundamental core that we're looking for is self-awareness. Know yourself, what you can handle and what you can ha not handle. Engagement in personal transformation and then inquisitiveness. Now, I learned this the hard way, inquisitiveness, that it's not a negative word when you come to the West. But in Africa, it could be a negative word. Remember, we are all teleological. When we say a word, the word imprints pictures in our brain. So in Africa, when we say somebody is inquisitive, it means that person is nosy. But in the West, it's not like that. Inquisitive people, they want to know what is going on so that they can help you. So when you see your boss person, and then he or she stretches their neck to look on the screen of your, comp your computers, don't try to hide it. Or when your professor asks you that, do you need help? Yes, of course, we all need help. Don't hide anything. If you need help, let them know. And that is the kind of inquisitiveness that I'm asking for. So traits are there that I've listed them. Curiosity, continual learner, learning orientation, accountability, integrity, commitment, hardiness, maturity, and then resource-oriented. The resource counts in everything, you know, so make sure you get the results. You can play all the beautiful soccer game, but in the end, if you lose, nobody will ask you that who played the best of game. It's like who won the game. So think about the result. That is very important. And we talk about the cognitive piece. Think about the environment. You know, 
Does it make sense what I'm doing with the environment? In fact, when we talk about stewardship, we're talking about stewardship with yourself, how we take care of your body, and then stewardship with your neighbors, how we take care of your neighbors, stewardship with the environment, how we take care of the environment, and then the stewardship with God, how we become accountable to our creator. Some of these things, you have to think about that. Global mindset is there, and then thinking agile, and then pattern recognition. Remember the pattern in your life. Every day, when I'm lecturing, I ask my student, do you like who you are becoming? Every day, please ask yourself that question. Do I like who I'm becoming? If you don't like who you are becoming, then think about the choices you are making because you should be the captain of your own ship. And then the business expertise means that you have to be global business savvy. Think about things that are going on globally and how you can take advantage of it because for an entrepreneurial person, every challenge can be turned into opportunity to make money out of it. And then think about stakeholders who can help you in being an entrepreneur and taking that kind of risk. You are a change agent as a leader anywhere you find yourself. So what do effective leaders do according to research? They perceive, analyze, and then decode. And then they have that kind of process be a very flexibility and discipline to act appropriately. Then they accurately identify effective managerial action. So these are one of the key things that global leaders do. And you can see that the arrows I have are cyclical. It means that perceiving, analyzing, and decoding means that you have to do it accurately in identifying effective managerial action. And then the behavior comes along with it. Remember that behaviors are really important. And when I talk about behaviors, I'm talking about the values you carry along with you as a leader. But most people learn from their leaders. So you need to be an exemplary leader that people can learn from you because you model the way. Let's look at some of the few building blocks of global leadership competencies. So I have them here. You need system thinking skills. And in system thinking skills, think about ethical decision-making, doing the right thing. The law of categorical imperative is clear. Wrong is wrong, no matter who is leading it or who is behind it. The opposite is true for what is right. So if you have leaders who are doing the wrong thing, tell them. I, you know, one thing we do that I like in North America here, in the United States, is that students evaluate their professors. But some students have an opportunity during the semester to tell the professors that, well, I think your teaching style, your classroom management, or this is not right for the professor to fix it. But guess what? They wait till the, the end of the semester to write the evaluation. And now they are talking about it. What happened along the way? We all missed the opportunity so that during the semester, you talk about some of these things and the professor can fix it so that all your colleagues can benefit from that. So always I tell my students that don't wait to the last minute before you talk about problems. Just hold the bull by the horn. Tell the person, you know, God do not honor his heroes. That is why all the wrong that David did is still in the Bible. You know, they could have taken it out from canonizing that piece of the Bible, but it's stuck in there so that we can all learn that leaders make mistakes, but God loved them anyway. So yes, we all make mistakes, but system thinking help you to make the ethical decisions as a leader. Then let's talk about interpersonal skills, mindful communication, how to create build or build trust, and then teamwork is really important in the 21st century leadership. You can see that attitude and orientations are also there in global mindset, cognitive complexity, and then cosmopolitanism. We are all moving to the cosmopolitan areas that, so suburbans are dwindling, the rural communities are dwindling, and most people are moving to the urban cities. How do we get that kind of cosmopolitan ideas in changing that place? And then threshold traits, where we talk about personal attributes of integrity, humility, inquisitiveness, and then hardness. These are the trends of building blocks of global leadership. So the cognitive is at the bottom. You need to have the mind, which is right, and then relationship building, because now leadership is all about relational. You have to have a relationship with people that you work with. And then the business and organizing expertise comes in. Then the dimensions that we talk about vision, which is the system skills. Now, I am moving to the synopsis of the literature, focus on two questions. So the first question is, what capabilities do global leaders need to be effective and how can leaders most effectively develop these capabilities? So here too, there are a lot of surveys and a couple of things that we came up with that experts possesses more extensive knowledge. So try to be an expert in something. You know, some of you are learning to be leaders. Some of you are learning diplomacy. Some of you are learning management. Everywhere that you are learning, try to be competent in that area. One thing that I've seen from artisans in Africa, people, electricians, uh, masons, all these people, you can see that they can build beautiful houses, but the 
touch it, finishing touches. Sometimes it's a problem. Painting, you have some rough edges and all this. And if you come to the advanced world, you can see that the finishing touches are perfect because they know how to measure every corner, you know, every centimeter, everything. They know how to measure it and then make sure that they have done extensive work in that area. You need that kind of extensive knowledge. Even building bridges and all the tunnels, you can see that in the advanced world, these engineers are using the best of whatever they learn in the classroom to put it into use. And then in Africa, we are not using that. Recently, a lady called me and she just moved to England, London, United Kingdom, and she had a job. She has been teaching science uh, in Africa for a long time in high school. And then she came to England, had the same job for interview. She, she was late to the interview because her train was late. And they said that, okay, get these questions. We're going to ask you these questions, but then go home and then answer them. She called me how God works in a miraculous way, that the questions they gave her, she couldn't have been able to answer even one out of the 50 questions, even though she's been teaching science all her life for 20 years. And then she told me that she never knew that how science is applied in the West is different. All of this has been taught from the classroom, but how to apply them practically, she didn't know. They asked her a simple question. One of the questions was that, if you have a bunch of snow sitting up there, and then how do you make sure the snow melts faster? Do you put salt? Do you put water and everything? And she didn't know what to do. Why? Because she's never seen snow before. And two, because she don't know what to do in that situation. They also asked her a question that if you see a candle and the candle is burning and it's about to burn, you know, over burn itself, what do you do? Do you put one, a blanket on it? Two, a water on it? Third, do you blow your, your mouth so that the air will quench it? What do you do first? And all these questions she struggled because the way she learned science in Africa was about understanding and memorizing, not about analyzing and then evaluating. So what I'm teaching you now in leadership in the 21st century is how to analyze the situation and then evaluate it. Because we live in a world, everything you want to know, you can see it in Google, but that is not the ultimate answer. How do you siphon the best of information? How do you analyze it to represent your present situation so that you can find a solution to it? So how do we identify exceptional global leaders? I'm going to finish very soon so that you can ask me questions because I believe in answering more questions than you know, lecturing. Lecturing is becoming almost outmoded. I want to have that kind of interaction with individuals when I do presentations. So how do we identify exceptional global leaders? We have to look at the global scope in our work. So if you are a professor, let's say in Africa, how do you look at the research? How do you look at the how your school is ranked? How do you look about how people are citing your work, your research work, peer review, presentations? You know, because we are the supply side of the workforce. And if our education is not accurate, it means that we're, the workforce is not going to benefit. I was in Ghana recently from May to August, and then I came back Christmas for three weeks. There was a lady who had finished University of Ghana, and I asked her to address a letter and post it for me. She didn't know how to do it. Then I was quite curious that I said that, can you write a memo for me? And she don't know how to write a memo. You have a degree and you don't know how to write a memo. You don't know how to address a letter. So it means that what kind of graduates are we churning out in the 21st century? That is important because the quality of graduates we churn out are the same thing that the workforce are gonna use. And if we are not churning out quality graduates, it means that the workforce is gonna be quite mediocre not to the standard of the world, because we are competing with everybody in the world. Research have found out that any idea that I'm thinking about now, we could learn about relevant leadership in the 21st century. Research have found that at least seven people on this planet are thinking the same too. So we have to know that. And then document success as a global change agent. Sometimes we need to document our success because sometimes we need to let the data show. We need data to support our claims. And then at least 10 years work experience in the field is important. How do you get work experience? Internship, national service, all these places you are getting experience from that. So don't let those little opportunities slip by. You have to demonstrate also intercultural competencies. Now, exceptional global leaders are different in these. Their perception of the work context, how they solve problems, how they think in a strategic way, how their work span through boundaries, their exercise of influence, and then the global skills that they have. In the work context, we're talking about how they manage multiplicities of problems and then huge challenges that come their way and they are very precocious in the way they do their things and handle ambiguities. So they also solve problems. 
They are cautious about gathering data and then understanding the root of the problems. It's not every data that solves the problem. Sometimes people think that math doesn't lie, but some math lies. If you say that we have 1,000, no, 1.7 million refugees of Ukraine to the borders of uh, Poland and Romania and the others, well, there are faces attached to the number of 1.7 million. And there are many reasons why people are fleeing. So we need to be able to talk about those things. I like numbers, but let's add face to the numbers. If you say 20% of the people are poor, there are reasons why some people are poor. You know, So we need to talk about some of those things. You have to be cautious in gathering data and then how you interpret them. And then we have to pay attention to cues that others fail to interpret. There are many cues about why things happen the way they do. We have to know that. And then we have to use mental stimulation to test possible actions and steps. Also, exceptional leaders are good at seeing the big picture and tracking multiple factors. There are many reasons that result into something. If you see that relationship is going bad, there's a reason why. There's a remote cause before you saw the immediate cause. If you see that organizations are struggling, people are living and they don't see, there's a remote cause and there's a immediate cause. You have to find out the remote cause before you think about the immediate cause. That is very important. And then we keep our options open in case strategies do not succeed. There's a difference between strategies and tactics. Strategies are the ultimate goal, what we want to do. But all those who have been in the military will tell you that we have this strategy of what we're going to do. When you get to the battlefield, you have to design some tactics that if this fails, what is the plan B? So you have to know that the strategy is a bigger picture, but tactics are the little things you have to twist here and there. Let's say two teams are playing a soccer game. They all have their strategy. I'm playing 4-4-2 system. Somebody is playing 4-3-3. Now, when you get to the field and you see that your players are struggling because of your strategy, you twist it tactically, you change the strategy so that you can match your opponent and maybe get a draw or win the game. Then they also spend a lot of time building and maintaining a relationship. Relationship is really key in the 21st century global leadership because everything is relational. You need to build a relation with stakeholders. You need to, and when we talk about stakeholders of leadership, who are the stakeholders? The government is the stakeholder, uh, the internal revenue service where you have to pay tax, they have interest in your profitability. They are also stakeholders, the community is a stakeholder, institutions like ourselves, students are stakeholders, the parents are stakeholders, and education is one of those institutions with the biggest number of stakeholders. Talk about stakeholders in education. Many people have interest. Now, can you believe that even Germany have an educational policy for Africa? They have policies about education. Why? Because they are looking at the trend of how we are developing engineers and medical doctors and all these things so that when they need some, they can come and pick some. Because for some reasons, we have problem brain drain where we have a lot of intellectuals. Africans have done well in churning out medical doctors, PhDs, and you know, engineers and nurses and great farmers right from almost 65 years of most African countries when we were attaining independence. But I can tell you on record that now we have more medical doctors from Africa in New York than the entire country of Ghana. How can that we are churning out the right human resources, but we are not keeping them to work for us? That's a problem. I went to one of the villages of Ghana, Ketikrachi, and the entire city had only one medical doctor. If you look at the ratio of medical doctors to patient, it's almost one is to 1,000. That means one medical doctor will have to take care of 1,000 patients. How is that possible? So in leadership, how do you look at that situation and then fix it? Recently, I was told that some individuals have formed up a new legal association to compete with the Ghana Bar Association so that they can also you know, induct people to be legal people in, in Ghana. I think that's a good thing. Sometimes we need to do some of these things. I've also advocated for we have standard and poor and then, and then you know, these organizations that rate the credit worthiness of countries. Why don't you have our own credit worthiness organization that can rate us? Of course, then the problems come with trust gap. Do we trust how we're going to rate our own credit worthiness? So be thinking about some of these things because these are the problems we are facing in the 21st century. And then mediating among and educating various stakeholders. Some stakeholders have more knowledge than the others. And that means that as a leader, you need to create that kind of awareness, evolving awareness about how the stakeholders, you can bring them to speed about what is going on in our sectors. And then we persuade others to change their mental models the way they think. Yes. 
Some people think, but it's about the amount of thinking they put into situations. In fact, before you can think through issues, you have to be conscious of your thinking. Conscious of your thinking. That is really important. And then we focus on discussion. Discussions are very important in academic work, in organizations. When we discuss the, the roundtable discussions, our forefathers used to do the same thing. They would meet under a big tree and then they discuss about families and everything. That is very important because knowledge is not in one individual's head. The more we discuss, the more we get to know many things about people. Now, one thing I also say in some of the classes that I teach is that the whole semester, tell me one thing or show me one thing I've never heard in my life as a professor, and then you get an A. And most students go that length of telling me something or showing me something or writing a reflective paper or doing a case study that I've never heard before. You know, that is very important. So always you have to be very genuine in the way you do your thing. And then using social capital to attract followers or maintain commitment to find a common good. I've given you many synopsis about exceptional global leaders, the skills that they entail. So learn about most of them. They also take culture into consideration. In fact, culture is strategy for breakfast. There are many things going on in the world that is, has come about because of culture. So make sure that you understand the culture, at least a glimpse, take a scan of the global culture, the trend where it is moving now. It's gonna help you a lot. That means that you have to listen to other news agencies, not only the local newspapers and then the local radio and TV stations, listen to CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, the National Public Radio, all these institutions is talk about the global world, what is happening. Because what is happening in China could affect you in Africa. What is happening in Asia or what is happening in India, what is happening in the Middle East or what is happening in Eastern Europe countries like Ukraine or Poland could also affect what is happening in Africa. So make sure that you are thinking global, but you are acting local. Then they spend lifetime building and maintaining relationships. I've always talked about relationship building, which is really key. So if you don't remember anything, remember that 21st century leaders think about how to build relationships, which is really key. And they mediate among and educate various stakeholders. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the little I wanted to share with you about thinking global and acting local, relevant leadership in the 21st century. So I am open for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Excellent presentation. Thank you. And indeed, you were born at night and not last night. Quite a lot of insight. And you are running through, and I was trying to catch up. And uh, uh, thankfully, we have these slides with us. Um, so it's uh, we can always refer. And, and uh, also, thankfully, we have the recording. So I'm sure I'm not the only one who will go back uh, to the recording, but also other students, because there was quite a wealth of information, quite a lot of insight, um, very rich, um, half an hour or slightly more that you have uh, delivered. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to just recap briefly before I can take on the questions. And um, on that, I highly recommend or rather even um, not only recommend, but I highly encourage all the participants to, you can type in your questions uh, and then I will pick them as we progress with the, with the discussion. Or better still, you can raise your hand just uh, by show of hand, and then I will give you the chance or the floor to engage uh, Prof further because I believe there is quite a lot uh, that we can uh, still squeeze out of him. So please um, be encouraged to uh, make sure that we actively engage him. So uh, just uh, to, to recap briefly, as I said, I'll, I'm just going to um, use two or three more uh, minutes just to try to tie in all that you've said. And uh, of course, it, it will not be exhaustive. But then uh, there are different reasons, uh, as you've highlighted, for being a leader, be it personal or situational reasons. And um, my question to myself and to uh, even the participants, especially the aspiring leaders uh, as students, what is your reason for being or wanting to be a leader? Question mark. I think this is a pertinent question to just bear at the back of your mind, having listened to this uh, exceptional discussion. Thank you, Prof, for drawing our attention to understand that it is not only in Africa, but even at the global context, that there is a shortage in global managerial capability. And this, for me, is really uh, something that I would like to highlight, um, echoing what you've said. The mission for the SALT Institute, which is to empower 
and fill this shortage by training transformational leadership leaders for Africa and for the whole world. It is pertinent to remind that indeed interdependence is inevitable. For sure, there is a ripple effect for whatever happens in one part of the globe, in one part of Africa. And clearly, uh, a very practical example you have shared is we see that uh, the issue that is going on between Russia and Ukraine. And this already has an effect or an impact to countries that are surrounding the, the, the two nations, but also to some extent, sooner rather than later, maybe we will experience or see these uh, challenges even having um, being seen in Africa. Indeed, whatever happens somewhere in Europe has effect to, to you, to me, sitting somewhere uh, in, in Africa, in a village in Africa, in one way or the other. The world is a small village, as it is commonly and oftenly said. So many insights and quotable quotes from uh, Prof's discussion that we should always have, not at the back of our minds, but actually in, uh, at the front of our minds. I will try to echo just five of those. First is try to be competent in one area. Allow me to paraphrase what I learned from uh, also one of our lectures in the SALT Institute and the uh, prof has eloquently elaborated further on that. If you cannot do something excellent, then don't do it. I'm, I'm just using my own words, but clearly you need to be competent and excellently do what needs to be done. Secondly, is your attitude is your altitude. How you know interesting that indeed the attitude, your attitude, the attitude that you have can really um, either push you or bring you down. You have to gain insight before talking about any topic. Very um, obvious, but very important to bear that in mind. And fourth, your network is your net worth. And the job, uh, especially giving the example of the um, getting employed in Africa, I, I, I think, and, and clearly uh, also not uh, with the same knowledge that you have, Prof. In the West, I think there is also something like this about network because there's uh, always issues of referrals, somebody having reference, you know, references. So this is, um, yes, of course, conspicuous in Africa, but also in the West, I believe that indeed you need to have the network. So um, underlining the importance of the network. And the fifth point that I would like to echo what Prof. said is indeed black and bold, very important to us with the systemic discrimination that is being seen in the West, and um, most importantly, um, to pass that to, uh, to, to the youth, to the generation that is coming after. Because if we are not comfortable in our own skin, then it becomes really difficult for somebody to um, you know, be courageous and uh, to deliver. So indeed, black and bold, such a, a bold statement, if I may say. And just one more thing, let the data do the talking. Prof has highlighted and shown us uh, why it's important to indeed have the data. I feel encouraged and positively challenged because in one of the classes, again, uh, one of our lecturers provoked us to consider doing uh, research and publishing those papers because we hardly see or read from African authors. And so we miss out on the global discussion. And uh, after all, there's one thing that um, uh, comes to mind is if you're not at the table, you're not sitting at the table, then it becomes really difficult to influence decisions. So it's very important that we are able to also have our voices heard as, as Africans and um, indeed let the data do the talking and not data that was collected and written by West regarding Africa, but by Africans uh, regarding Africa. So very, very important uh, uh, points that you've highlighted, Prof. Again, I cannot repeat everything that you've said because there's quite a lot of information, but I just wanted to um, pinpoint some of those that for me, uh, you know, just uh, was in front of my face and, and really spoke uh, to me. I believe all of us have been able to pick um, quite a number of uh, very important uh, reminders and, and most importantly, even new insights and new perspectives of looking up or at how you can uh, become a global leader uh, and you're still in a local environment in this 21st century. Thank you so much, Prof. So again, I am watching to see if there's any hands being raised or if we have any questions uh, on the floor. And um, I'm still uh, encouraging that we have the, uh, please feel free to type your questions and um, you can raise your hands. I want to assume uh, that um, we will have questions. And uh, silence should not mean that we are content or maybe you're digesting. So as you digest, I will try to pose a question to, to Prof. And then um, I will also encourage that uh, please raise your hand and uh, 
It can be a question, it can be a comment, it can be just an addition uh, to what Prof has told us. So feel free to, uh, or be, be encouraged to, to raise your hand or, or pose whatever comment you have in the chat. And so Prof, I'd just like to, to start this discussion uh, with, with a question. And you have mentioned uh, creativity is key. And uh, just to quote what you have um, highlighted to us that creative leaders are comfortable uh, with ambiguity and experiment to, to create different business models. They invite disruptive innovation. They encourage others to drop outdated approaches and take balanced risks. Prof, would you speak to a young leader joining us today or, or a leader to be on how to take balanced risks, especially professionally, um, you know, looking at very specific self-employment, um, because in Africa, getting um, a job um, is, is not so easy. And um, it's, it's the, the supply or rather the demand for employment is, is much higher than the supply. So maybe you could speak more on this. I, I would truly, truly appreciate that. And uh, uh, very specifically, or even maybe taking one step back, is this concept of there is no jobs in Africa just an illusion you know it's just something that has a narrative that has been passed over and over and over again that we are now be uh, trying to or starting to believe because um sometimes they say that a, a lie repeated uh, almost becomes or looks like a truth so is this something that actually is not even an issue to start with so i'd like to for you to just speak into these two or two aspects as as i uh watch for further questions and additional comments from from the participants Prof, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. I think one day when you become a professor, you will fill my seat, that is hard, because you jumped about 10 questions in one, and then you expect me to pass out of them. You talked about ambiguity, you talked about balance, race, and then they said there are no jobs in Africa and all those things. Uh, George Santayana said that to know your future, you must know your past. So to take that kind of balance risk, you have to know your past, you know, what you've gone through and what you can handle now, what risk you can take and what you can handle and what you cannot handle. In life, when you have to cry, sometimes cry. When you have to smile, smile. When it gets to a point that you don't know, be open and tell your student that I don't know, but I'll find out. That's taking a balance risk. Now, if you learn to be a leader and you go to look for a job and you're applying to be a CEO when you know you've just finished a first degree and the minimum requirement is a master's degree or an MBA, it means that you're not taking that kind of balance risk. So it means that know what you can handle when you're taking a balance risk. And then get along with other people. So there are many partnerships out there. Most organizations in America is, you know, Procter & Gamble started by two people, p &G, or Johnson & Johnson, two people, or Ernst & Young, two people. Why is it that? Because there are many things we lack when we take taking risk. Remember, entrepreneurship comes from the French world taking risk. So when you're taking risk, you have to take a measured risk. Well, I'm involving my money or every resource that I have into this business. I have one I have to investigate before I invest. I have to know the risk that I'm taking. If anything comes to a halt and I can't get anything, how do I exit? That is what I mean by a balanced risk. So you have to know your past and that will help you to know your future. The gate also said one thing that your most unhappy customers are your greatest source of learning. And in life, you can see that a lot of people are not happy about it. They criticize you. And I believe in one thing that criticism is not the best form of discussion or interaction. If you want to interact with people, you don't begin to criticize them. But when people begin to be unhappy about things that you are doing, learn from what they are saying. I wish politicians would take this word serious. It helps them to be balanced in taking a risk. When the opposition is talking about something that this is not good, this is not good, most of the time, they turn a deaf ear to it until they are out of power and they realize that, oh, if we had fixed this, then everybody would have been happy. But they, they turn it to be a propaganda, and then in the end, it turned out to be the right thing. So I think that we need critical friends, people among ourselves and our families, those in our one market friends, who will tell us that this thing that you are doing is not going to help you. But I also believe that sometimes, because your calling belongs to you alone, you might take some risk that nobody will believe in you. That, well, this thing that you're doing is not going to work. In a relationship, it happens. You pick a guy or a lady, and your parents will say, oh, no, we don't. 
but you know that this is my heart. This is where I want my soul to be. So sometimes you have to take that risk. I believe that is also a balanced risk because in your own personal assessment, you know that this is the right thing that I'm doing. And even if it doesn't succeed, I know that I love the person and I'm taking that kind of risk. It helps. The same applies to business. So business is just like having a relationship. It's all about expectations. So you have to know the expectation and how you take that balance risk in meeting that. Now you talk about jobs in Africa. I think that here comes to leadership. Anywhere you pass in Europe or in America, you can see institutions hiring. We are hiring, we're hiring. And now you come to Africa and people don't have jobs. And you ask yourself, why is it that we have all the raw materials and all the resources and then we can't create a job out of it? It's a mystery. So you have cocoa that is being produced, coffee. If you go to Uganda, you have banana, you know, everywhere. And these bananas, these boys using bicycles, we take them out, you know, in a long ride to marketplaces. Some are using it to make beer, but it's, apart from that, they are wasting it. So how many different use can we put into the banana? How many storages can't we build? How can we use it to create a job for our people? We have cocoa in Ghana and Africa and other places. Do you know what? How many cocoa manufacturing companies do we have? But we, we, we get the cocoa, dry them and everything in the ports. We get juice sack that we even import. And then we put everything into the juice sack, ship them to Belgium and Switzerland and America. And they produce one of the best chocolates and then they send the chocolates to us to buy. If we have every district a cocoa processing plant that we can process this cocoa, how many jobs can it create for our own people? For 50 years in Ghana, they have not been able to process diamond. So we send diamond in a raw state to outside world, they process them, and then the diamond rings and the diamond chain, we like them. So why can't we process them on our own? I've been told that there's a guy called Ali, an Indian in Ghana who is now working on these diamond rings and diamond gold, and he's selling them for higher prices. How do we get Ali to teach the local citizens some of these, how to make these diamond, so that they can also help you know, to transfer the job. Because if you have a skill, technical know-how in America or in Europe, one thing I, I know I like about white people is that they don't like anything about you, but your brain, what you bring to the table. Unfortunately in our land, people are not even talking about brains. So let's say the CEO comes to a meeting and then when he or she asks, is there any question? Nobody want to ask questions. I don't want to be the bad person. And even if you ask questions, your colleagues are going to intimidate you. That Why did you ask that question? See, but if we don't ask questions, how do we get answers? So Plato says that judge a person by the quality of their questions, not the quality of their answers. We should begin to ask questions. That makes us the leaders, the power of why. Always ask why, why, why as a leader? And the answers are always in the why. When we ask why, we can produce jobs, we can have balanced risk, and then we can deal with ambiguity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. And I just want to take on the last statement that you've, you've said. If we don't ask questions, how do we get answers? We should begin to ask, to ask questions. And please, dear participants, this is a call to, to all of you. Ask questions. Because if you don't ask questions, then we don't get answers. And, and clearly, I very much um, want to underline what you've said, that it's, it's the value of the the, the answer, the, the, it's not the question that you ask, uh, or rather it's not the answer that you receive, but the question that you ask that can create even job opportunities, very important and very valid points that you've raised. Um, just on that, uh, Prof, I just want to come back to a statement that you've said, and then I see um, one question. Uh, thank you, Herbert, I'll, I'll come back to, to your question shortly. But you've said about value addition, and um, already you have highlighted things that we can add value. Um, maybe I'm being a little bit impatient, but uh, do you, uh, we, we have answers. We know that there's cocoa being produced in Ivory Coast in, in West Africa, but this is not being done. Why isn't it being done? I know that we have a lot of answers to, to, to those, but I'm just wondering, is, uh, is it me being impatient or it's because there's, um, there's, uh, this information should be out there. People should know about this value addition. So why is it not being done? That's number one. And um, just linked to that, um, I'm, I'm Kenyan and um, 
I have also been brought up uh, in, in a farm and, and agriculture is uh, near and dear to my heart. And um, I remember when uh, we were young, we, we had pyrethrum. Uh, I don't know if all of you are familiar with pyrethrum, but it's, it's, it's used to um, get biological insecticides. So we, we used to have uh, the smallholder farmers planting the pyrethrum. But then in the uh, late 90s, the pyrethrum board of Kenya just collapsed. And then that was it. Now they've tried to revive it and um, well, we're still miles to go and uh, it was a backbone for the, for the country. I use this particular example and I'm trying to, I will try to expand that to the African context. Africa is familiar or is uh, well known um, as a food basket, potentially it can feed the whole world. Why um, is it that we cannot, uh, we are producing and we are wasting more than what we are producing? Look at the example you've said for, for banana, whereby there is production which is high, but there is no value addition. So Prof, I've said so many things, uh, but the, the bottom line is, why is it that we are missing this value addition that is coming? Is it finances? Is it lack of um, incentives? Is it lack of um, the capacity building? Is it, uh, what exactly in your opinion uh, is, is the bottom line? Thank you. Well, you ask intelligent question. I must recommend you for that. Uh, I've been in Mombasa many times, and I, I have a lot of friends who are Kenyans as well. Uh, first, ask yourself, I don't know whether you are Kikuyu or you belong to any other tribe in, in Kenya. Are you a Kikuyu? Uh, no, uh, Prof. Okay. I am a so, Kalenjin. OK, so ask yourself why that the land, uh, Nze, the first president of Kenya, uh, Jomo Kenyatta, and his son, Uhuru Kenyatta, who is now the president of Kenya, the Kikuyus own over half the lands of Kenya. Have you asked yourself why? Don't you think that is a problem? That one tribe, because they are in political power, have access to all the land. Is that true or false? Now confirm to me. Is that true? Because I know that is true. I can confirm that uh, and on record that you're right, that's true. Yes, so it means that I've said it, the Kenyan, I like being Kenyan a lot. And I like the ways of Kenyans and the way people do their things. I like the rules and everything that's going on. Now, a food basket, if you go to uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, and I've been there, they said that, they said, saying that they say that, that God had all the food basket, the, you know, the basket of all the natural resources. And then when he reached, Kenya, uh, Congo, he was tired, so he dumped the rest there. He dumped the rest there. So all the natural resources you can find in the world is in, Kenya, is in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Now go there and see how the place is. Now, if you talk about cobalt, that is used in making laptops and cell phones and everything, 80% of the world resources of making that is in Democratic Republic of Congo. But look at the poverty level. There are a lot of mm -hmm. people fighting against each other and the question comes to what Mandela asked, that it's not everybody who wishes Africans for. Well. You know, some people are businessmen. You have the Chinese that is taking over all Africa. Zambia, they are taking over the, the seaport and then the airport. They are not taking over the container shippings and other things. So the Chinese are in Africa for their interest, right? Now, if you see any European or American in Africa, they also have their interest. They know the quality of cocoa you produce. They know because the world is interdependent. Mm -hmm. I'm talked about making American great. He was thinking about how do we inwardly build America so that Americans can enjoy. So how do you inwardly build your country so that people can enjoy? And that comes to leadership. So leadership is everything in the world. Leadership is everything. And when we talk about uh, the food basket, another thing the leaders should do that we consume everything we don't produce and we produce everything we don't consume. That's mm -hmm. Biggest problem. If you're consuming everything you don't produce, so importation, we import a lot of things into our country, a lot of things. Anytime you rely on import, it means you are providing employment for other citizens who are, who are importing from. And then if you export a lot to other countries, you are providing employment for our people. But what do we export? Raw materials. We don't add value. Do you know that salt alone have got about 14,000 different uses? Now imagine if we specialize in salt, you know specialization of 14,000. How many jobs wouldn't it provide for our people? Talk about our woods. You know, we have a lot of natural woods that's in our countries. Talk about animals and even the, the tourism industry. 
you know, you go to any zoo in America or other places, how many lions do they have? How many, how many <laughs> elephants do they have? But we have them in abundance in Africa. And how many stories are we getting? Take Qatar, for example, a population of 3 million. They've been able to lobby post the World Cup this year, November, December, right? Mm -hmm. Able to get more than 3 million to, to visit Qatar every year. Now, as a Stories are coming to Kenya or Ghana or Nigeria or Ivory Coast. Not many. Even if tourists that are coming, how have we developed our tourism industry? Where is even the parking lot that these people will park their car? It's not there. You know, even the, the basic thing, the front door of, of bathrooms and the toilet facilities are not there in these tourist areas. But we're talking about the tourism industry. So how do we develop it? And this boils to leadership. So the leaders should have that kind of vision to see that we have all the natural resources, but what are the brains to turn this around? Okay, I have some friends in America here who design software for, you know, uh, Rolls Royce and then aeroplanes. They design software. So the leaders should know that how do we get these African citizens doing well in all over the world, bring them, we give them accommodation, we give them all the resources so that they will employ 1,500 people and then train them how to design the same software so that we can design them here and then sell it to the outside world and make a lot of money. They are not looking for that kind of people. They are looking for political followers who will do them yeah, yeah, and follow them so that they can always hold into power. Lord Acton said that power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Now, Anson Suchi is saying that it's not power that corrupts Africans, but the fear of losing power has corrupted them. They get into power situations and they don't want to lose it. So what do they do? They entrain themselves in amassing wealth and lands and everything. And what do we do for natural resources? Are we not going to the international market always to borrow? People are selling debts and equity and everything at the international market. We always go there to the IMF and the World Bank. What do we do to borrow? But we have natural resources and we are using all those that as collateral and equity to borrow. What are we doing to the next generation? So everything is about leadership. It takes Magafuri, look at what he did. Internally, he was able to raise 4 billion of their local currency to build a new dam hydroelectric dam so that it can supply electricity so that that kind of power outage will be done away. This is a leadership and we should all learn from that. We have the power within our abilities in Africa. We need the leaders. We have the human resources. People are educated. Africans are smart. Anywhere they go, they can excel. You see, when we talk about the youthful population in the world is in Africa, where we have 65% of our population between the ages of 25 and 35. So even Japan now have got the American lottery system that they are looking for African immigrants. Germany is doing the same. Uh, Canada is doing the same. America is doing the same. Why is it that you go to the American embassy and they are looking for somebody with at least a degree? And they are looking for specific area, nurses, health sector, because it's an aging population. They need this kind of youth. We have the human resource and natural resources. It takes only leadership to turn those resources around and no African have to travel to anywhere again. We can do well in a country because one thing I know from research, every immigrant is a target worker. They want to make something and go back to their country. They enjoy being in their country. I always enjoy when I come home because home is where mama lives. Mandela said it. We all want to be home. But the leaders have made Africa in such a situation that economically it's difficult to stay there. Things are really expensive, right? And then there's no job. And then the income is so low. So let's look at some of these things for leaders to fix them so that we can enjoy our own motherland. Thank you, thank you so much, Prof. So much passion in, in even your response. And indeed, home is where mama is. And um, again, I don't want to be the only one uh, uh, being uh, monopolying uh, in, in trying to ask the questions. I would want to give others the floor, but I will come back to um, two more questions uh, back to you. But please, uh, Herbert, I see your question in the in the chat function. Uh, would you kindly uh, unmute yourself and, and pose the question to, to Prof? Herbert, uh, could you please unmute yourself and pose the question? And if you're experiencing some challenges, maybe, ah, yeah, I see you unmuted. Please go ahead. Yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for the opportunity. And uh, thank you, sir, for the uh, very revealing uh, 
presentation. So my question uh, is obvious. Uh, it has to do with the fact that it, 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 it's very critical that we train uh, global thinkers in the 21st century. And you've alluded to it several times in your, your presentation. And you even alluded to the fact that um, the educational system, there seems to be a lot of loopholes uh, in terms of being able to uh, deal with this matter. And my question uh, really is that we, we, we know where the issues are as regards the educational system, you know, and then uh, it's uh, incapacity, you know, to train global thinkers. So how do we arrest uh, this kind of uh, a situation? Because as you rightly said, the brain dream in our generation is very serious. It's very serious. You have people with certificates, but nothing to show for the certificate they have. And uh, you tend to wonder uh, what they were taught in the school. So how do we uh, deal with this kind of a problem? And then maybe a follow-up uh, question to the last uh, statement you, you, you made. Again, it's very obvious that uh, Africa, we have a leadership challenge. The problem with our leaders is very overwhelming. You know, the, 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 the question is, how are we going to change this kind of, you know, a narrative with the kind of leaders that we, we, we have and then with the kind of youths that we also have in our continent. The resources are there, yes. But the leadership problem, how, how do we address it? For me, that is uh, where my, my, my heart beats uh, this evening is. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Herbert. I think uh, you had three questions about the, you use a word that is interesting to me, how do we arrest? <laughs> Very interesting way, but uh, the quality of our graduates, uh, we all should be concerned about that. <laughs> and it's because that our curriculum is designed in such a way that it's not been practical, it's not been hands-on, it's not been evidence-based. You have professors that wants you to memorize everything and reproduce exactly what they said in class. If you do something different then you don't get the right grade, that is wrong in the 21st century. Like I said, if you look at Bloom Taxonomy, uh, memorizing and remembering is at the bottom of learning. You have not learned anything when you can produce formulas. That's not learning. You know, or just give a definition of something. That's not learning. When you can analyze and synthesize and evaluate, that's where learning has taken place. So our old way of teaching has become, that, that is our old right, has become the new wrong in the 21st century. And we need to change how we teach. It. The other part is that the resources, the tools to teach, in Africa, you have some professors who have 80, 120, 200 students in a class. I finished my first degree in Bristol Cape Coast where economics, we had about 450 students. In the auditorium, some students will have to go closer to the, you know, the speakers to listen to the professor who is standing on the podium to speak because they can hear him or her. If you have that kind of situation, how do you even accurately grade, assess the competency of the students in the course that you are teaching. So that is the numbers, the huge numbers of these classes also affect quality teaching and rigor in the academic world. So let's look at our curriculum, the way we design, how we design course. I have a book about uh, Africa. I think I have a copy here that I will show about how we can teach hands-on education and teaching in Africa that I talked about how we can make education practical. And it tells you that we have to move from the old way of teaching to the new way. That is the rigor and quality of education. That's the only way we can churn up quality educational students who are ready for the job market. Because the world is very dynamic and you are not competing with only people in Ghana or Kenya or anywhere, but Chinese are there, other you know, citizens from Germany and uh, Australia, all those people can also come and be an expatriate and well for those organizations. Have you realized that most jobs, MTN and all 
and most of their CEOs are from Nigeria and other places and South Africa. It means that one job that you are looking for, you are not competing with people from only your country, but other countries as well. The second one is about the leadership challenge. 80% of leadership is followership, according to Kelly from 1992. We started talking about followership studies, and I did my dissertation on political leadership and political followership. I realized that we've not done enough of research on followership, so I concentrated on that. So if 80% of leadership is followership, it means that 80% of these followers elect 20% who are leaders. And how do we elect our leaders? So we don't import leaders from the Western world to Africa. We elect our own leaders. Are we picking the right leaders? That's the question we all should be asking ourselves. So if all along we've had a leadership challenge since we had independent, most Africans from the 1960s up to now, early 60s up to now, we are still getting bad leaders. Then who do we blame? The people should blame ourselves. Because every constitution of every country starts to be the people. We call the shots. And remember, you are employing that politician. So why do we allow these politicians to lord themselves over us and be arrogant and everything? And the people sit down, throwing our hands in the air as if there's nothing that we can do to solve the situation. So let's begin to look for individuals who can be good leaders for us. You don't actually have to go for a political party that I'm um, this party, I'm that party. Can't we get independent people to go to represent us in parliament? People with integrity in our communities and think that, well, this man is noble, this woman is really noble and have a high integrity. Let's go for an independent candidate who will go and bring sanity to our parliament. You know, and then let our institutions that they are not working. If somebody is, let's say, um, let's say somebody is the auditor general and this, that person brings a report about corruption in government, how do those in politics treat that person? The best they can do is that make the person look bad and then kick the person out of office. What do the people say? Nothing. But the person is a public servant trying to help the public fund. And when politicians pick on these people, they publish. We, the people that are supposed to protect these people, we don't do that for them. So that is a problem. So in the leadership, I have this to say that not all change is progress, but all progress does require change. Not all change is progress, but all progress that require change. So it means that it's not every leader that you vote for can represent a progress. But if you want to make a progress, that requires a change. So let's keep changing our leaders or trying to fish out the right leaders for our communities because the West have been able to do that. The West have been able to get the best leaders they want to fit their time. Remember, leadership is not about I've been in this political party or I've been in this institution for long. It's about the situation, the moment that we need a leader. And in Africa, how do we make promotion? Somebody has thought for about 20 years, and that's when they qualify to be a leader. I saw one thing even in Ghana that before you become a principal or headmaster of a senior high school, you need to be at least 40 years. Who brought that policy? What has age got to do with becoming a principal of an organization? So in Africa, we're thinking about years of service, not the competency that a person brings on board. That's a problem in leadership. Need to be looking at that. And then you talk about the youth and the kind of youth that are, we are churning out. In fact, I must tell you that most of our actors and actresses and musicians grew up in the hood. And unfortunately, these youth are learning from them at their models. That is dangerous. Most of them are not educated. All that they know is gangster life that the youth think that that is shortcut of corners. Have you seen the trend recently that even the West Africa Examination Council and all the examination council, there are a lot of cheating in the examination. Before even students will write a test, the examination itself have leaked already and people have the questions. Now, let's think about the moral piece of this. How do I learn hard when there's a shortcut of getting the questions, you know, and then passing it? I will not demotivating people who are learning hard because there's a short way of every year examination questions leaking. How do leaders solve this? So yes, every youth is learning from an adult. They are learning from their leaders. So the question you should be rather asking Reverend is that are leaders modeling the way? Are they setting a good example? Because Chenua Achebe said that there's nothing wrong in Africa. Our environment, our climate and everything is perfect. The only thing we are lacking is exemplary leadership. Leaders who will model the way. And I think that is the problem of Africa. Excellent, Prof. Very well said, indeed. 
Africa has not does not have any problems. Leadership is is the key thing and and the main problem. And and uh, just uh, a follow up question on that, Prof. You have said that eighty percent of uh, leadership is um, uh, of leadership is followership, and uh, twenty percent of of all uh, the leaders that are actually selected by these eighty percent followers uh, who are following. Uh, very interesting, but I, I I just want to hear your opinion uh, on what you would have to say on, for example, in Africa where we know um, there is quite a lot of external influence to our leaders. Look, let's just uh, you know zoom into West Africa for example. There's quite a lot of influence with uh, from France in 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 this context. What do you do say on this? It's not about the people who go to the ballot uh, or to the polling station to you know. Um, choose uh, who they want to be their leaders, but there's quite, there's something overall that sometimes overrules what the people uh, actually want. Would you speak um, just a little bit more on this kindly prof? And then afterwards, I would uh, like to give the floor to Reverend Godwin. Please prof. Thank you, Catherine. Yes, there's outside influence because they're also looking for how their citizens will survive. Remember, we talked about interdependence. So if they need chocolate, the land that I live here in Wisconsin, six months is snowing. And when it's winter time, everything is dead. You can't grow anything. They have all this summer, three months, to grow corn and legume. If you go to Great Britain, they, the only two things they produce is that they have uh, potatoes and then wheat. That's the only thing their land will produce. Now, how does the Queen of England get a gold crown that she wears? It should come from Africa. You see, so the influence here is how do I get it from the people? Well, I have to send some people there. So it's not everybody who come to our land who really wishes that well. They are all there for a reason. So the influence is that if you are voting, they have an influence. Which of the candidates that they think is going to help champion their cause? Because they depend on you. I've always advocated that Africans should trade among themselves. You know, we have 1.4 billion population. If we are trading among ourselves, do you know the size of that market? Mm -hmm. But Africa, which has been formed about trading in Africa, I try to consult for them to see how we can trade. You know what? The headquarters is in Kenya. The headquarters is in Kenya. And they asked me that the proposal to consult should be given to them by hand. I mean, we're talking about 21st century. How do we do that? When we have electronic gadgets, e emails, then you can attach everything. Now try calling somebody from Kenya to Ghana or Kenya to Botswana and see the cost. But try calling America from Kenya or Ghana or and then see the cost. Why is it that even calling each other in Africa has become so expensive? Again, come back to leadership. Then let's see about languages that we have. How do we use that to advantage? How many local newspapers do we have in our local language? We don't, right? We don't have, mm -hmm. I remember when my mother visited me and stayed with me and I showed my mother the picture of Adam. She nearly passed out. And I, I said, why mom? She said, you, you are something else. Adam is not, I said, Adam is black. Go to National Geographic. And then they will tell you that our genes, our chromosome, the Y chromosome, how the world origin came about. You know where National Geographic found the origin of this earth? Island of Party in Kenya. You know the Island of Party where the people do nah, 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 when they talk like that? That is yes. where they found the DNA of Adam. So when I showed the first picture of Adam, who was about 14 feet, and I showed my mother, she nearly passed out. Why? Because all her life, she's 71. She's never seen or never heard that Adam could be a black person. So our identity is a problem. And Kroma said that something when we had Ghana had independence, that the, he's there to protect the integrity and dignity of Africans. We need to do that. Our identity is that we are Africans. And unfortunately, those Americans here, those who renown, those blacks living in, in England, those in Jamaica, most of them don't even know that they're Africans. But they are. Every black person on this planet, you are an African. But how many people know, how many people are proud of that? So it's also about leadership. Leadership is not only what you do, but the awareness you create about people. Because learn is this, you've seen many things for a while, you don't believe it exists, and somebody open up your mind to say, oh, this is how learning is. 
And Lennon is just like, there's a new music on the radio TV. I've been a radio presenter before, a morning show host before. And there's a new music nobody understands. And then the radio will keep playing it and playing it before you know you are singing it. Why? But we kept playing it and playing it. Mm -hmm. So if our, our chiefs and traditional leaders and our leaders will begin to hammer on community service, let's say service learning, and then talk about values that everything you have to do, think about your personal values. One that is modeled as a culture of that organization, everybody who comes to that country will grow up to learn about that. That is what Lin Kuan Yew used to change Malaysia. Now you can buy a gun in Malaysia because when you spit a gun on the floor, they are fining you $500. How can you get that kind of money? So look at how deterrent it is. So you would do it. Now, with all our challenges going to the global market, you want a respect, but you are coming to always borrow. You go to the World Bank or IMF, all you do is to borrow. When they have influence on you, don't you know that in accounting, a debtor is your asset? So they own you. Yeah. Debt collector can call you anytime. We know in our homes, when your mother or dad owes somebody, they will come to your house anytime. Right? Sometimes your mom will tell you, tell them I'm not there. <laughs> You have the money, but because you owe them, they will come to you. You will never have your privacy. They will never give you peace. That's what's happening. Influence is there. But do we keep blaming them? Because most of us have been over 60 years after independence. Let's say you're born to a poor family. You have been twists and turns of your life. After 60 years, do you still blame your parents for being poor? You can't anymore because you are old. In Africa, you retire at 60. It means that most African countries might have retired now, 65, 62, 63, after independence. So we should stop blaming slavery and all those things and think within the inward journey. What attitude can we adopt? What can we use with our natural resources? How do we consume our own locally manufactured rice and, and their clothing and everything so that we can do well for ourselves? Because the leaders are showing the way wearing locally manufactured clothes, they are locally manufactured food, the citizens will learn from the leaders, the youth will learn from them. And guess what? We are providing employment for ourselves, we are doing well for ourselves, and then we seal corruption because corruption is also taking a quarter of all our money from foreign aid to money internally generated. When we see that kind of corruption, what do we use the money for? Bridges, hospitals, schools, good park system, good police system, good military system, and then our country will become prosperous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And indeed, you don't even repeat yourself. You bring in fresh ideas, fresh insights, very uh, interesting and, and um, evidence of, of the wealth of experience that, that you have, Prof. Thank you for, for responding to that. Indeed, the narrative is biased. There is already, um, uh, the, 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 when Africa has been painted, is already a uh, duck, if I can use that word. And we need to change that narrative. And uh, I very much like your response, especially by you know uh, coming back to the fact that if we keep borrowing, then we lose uh, even the audacity to stand in front of people. There is a famous, I don't know if it's a saying, but something that I came across, that he who feeds you owns you. So if we are being fed by somebody, we, we rely as a, as a nation, as a continent on uh, whoever has mercy on us, then we, we surely are not, um, we do not have any democracy, if I can uh, put it that way. So indeed, there's no, it's, it's time to stop looking for excuses and we cannot use slavery as an excuse anymore. It's, it's time for, to move on. Thank you so much, Prof. And um, now I see I have some questions uh, from the participants, but I would like to give the floor to Reverend Godwin to pose your question and then I can come back uh, to, to, to some of the two questions that I've received and uh, a pity that the clock is ticking. We have 20 more minutes, uh, but I, I believe in those 20 minutes we'll hear quite a lot. So please Reverend Godwin, you have the floor. Thank you. Good evening, um, Prof. Good evening, all participants. Uh, a wonderful lecture and a wonderful interactive session. But as the, as the lecture and the interactions were going on, uh, I don't know whether I should um, propose another uh, topic, which is uh, maybe a refining uh, of this particular one. We should think global and act local. It's, a, it's as if all the things we do locally, I mean, are, are, are not progressive. We are not, we are not making it. 
Meanwhile, we know what is happening in other parts of the world, how industrialization has, you know, taken third world economies to become, um, you know, first, first class economies. We see how the West is, 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 is doing with leadership, quality of leadership. We see how nations that do not have, you know, uh, how do you call it, natural resources, are able to turn this around. So our leaders travel all over the world. They see what is happening. But it's like the way we act locally, it's, 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 it's not really helping us to progress. Why don't we rather say that we, we think global and act global? We must act within the global context. We must look at best practices in leadership, in agree, in everything, in politics. Can't we see what is happening in the global global arena, and 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 you know adopt those uh, best practices? Why should we think local? It's like uh, the, the local way of doing things in Africa stagnates or to retrogress. So I am tempted to propose, you know, uh, uh, another topic that we think global and act global so that we can we can catch up with the rest of the world that is my my beef thank you all right thank you very much reverend that is a wonderful question but I, unfortunately that cannot be done and this is why what works for americans is different from what works for Ghanaians or kenyans the democracy that is practiced here has been practiced over 400 years that is different from our young democracies where we are practicing Yes, so you think global about the trend of global work, but you cannot act global because you cannot learn from somebody and become exactly like that. You have to use the global knowledge to fix your local situation. So you are not looking to be like America, or you're not looking to be like uh, Great Britain, but you are looking to be like Kenya or Ghana or anything. And when we talk about countries, we all have specialization and the limit of what we can do. Look at what Belgium did. Belgium is in Europe. We realize that when we come to services and everything, Great Britain and the, and the Germans talk about technology, they have taken over. So they decided to do farming, to be the farming basket of Europe. So what animal husbandry, food production is coming from Belgium. And they produce that. So they are thinking global about the 28 EU countries. But then they're thinking local. What do we have comparative advantage or absolute advantage that we can use to solve that our global or European Union problem so that we can do well for ourselves. Because when people are really efficient to do something and then you want to compete with them globally, of course, you're not going to be able to compete with that. That is why global has been the buzzword, which is very important. Now you talk about there are models everywhere. So Americans have a model here. Let me explain to you. If you look at the sports in America, they have uh, basketball, which is number one. And then they have baseball and American football is the number one. American football is different from our soccer. So American football and basketball and baseball, and they even have ice hockey before it comes to soccer. And then they realized that their women were doing well in the World Cup soccer, but their men were not. So they decided to look at different countries and models. And then they look at Hoffenheim in Germany, their models of soccer. And then they send some American players there. They send some American players to look at the model. And then guess what? Now they have, we have American players men players playing for Chelsea, for Barcelona, for teams in Germany, and they are using that to build their national team. That is acting global, you know, or thinking global and then acting local. You look at the models of the world and then use it to act in a local way. So let me give you an example. You come to America and you see our road network, that's global. Europe is built similar. North America, America and Canada is built similar. If you go to South America, it built similar. So you look at our road network. Oh, this is a beautiful road. They have toll booths and everything. How do we use this same idea to get some engineers to come and work with our local engineers so that we can build local roads that will fit our situation? Because we have cocoa farming lands uh, and roads and other things that they don't have. So yes, the organization's culture are different. The, the people are different. A lot of things, the taste of the people are different. Even lifestyle of the global world are different from one country to the other. So you cannot think global and then act global because we are all different and our orientations are different. And because of that, what do we do to fix our local situation? 
Talk about Africa, we respect elders, we have chiefs. So how do you build your democracy is such that you also include the elders and the chief. You can't do away with them because they are traditional leaders. And that is why it is important to think global, but to act local because some local circumstances, you cannot generalize them at the international market. Very well, very well, very well, bro. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, uh, both Reverend uh, for, for your question and, and indeed Prof for giving practical examples of not only just having global uh, thinking and, and, uh, and the global and the local aspect and giving us very practical examples. Thank you so much. It gives perspective and more understanding when we have examples. Thank you. I uh, recognize and uh, want to acknowledge the presence of the Salt Institute Management on the call. I, I still have two more questions for you, Prof, but before I take on those two questions, I see um, the hand of uh, Ambassador Ajay, and um, her being one of the uh, Salt Institute uh, management, I would like to give her the floor, and then I will come back to two questions that I've received from the participants. Please, Ambassador, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Prof, and thank you so much for this uh, very excellent and uh, thought-provoking presentation. I think you have shared, indeed, uh, a lot of um, your rich research uh, findings on global leadership, uh, your own perspectives, and and also you know some concepts. And I I think it just points to the fact that uh, uh, today's uh, leaders need to navigate the complex uh, web of um, these dynamics. Um, and I think we appreciate uh, the fact that you have shared a lot of that with us, um, underlining the point that leadership is uh, the ability to make a difference. Um, as maybe this may not be a question because I think um, um, Catherine has already very intelligently uh, made reference to that. Um, but I, I just wanted to, you know, just seek your thoughts because the literature always blames, you know, the lack of leadership or bad leadership in Africa on, you know, greed and corruption and incompetence and dysfunctional systems. Um, and I, 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 I don't know whether, um, you know, well, I just want to hear from you whether there are other factors that, you know, uh, play a role here. Uh, and I'm thinking about our very culture um, you know, is, does it really promote a lack of ambition? Uh, are there some kind of, um, you know, uh, and also a reference has been made to uh, the narrative and our very past, our, our history of having suffered indignities and racism and still suffering uh, discrimination. Does it, uh, some psychological issues, does this really, or do this really affect our ability to be confident and to really, you know, rise up to the challenge as other regions, um, you know, in the world, um, you know, may be able to do, you know, Latin America or Asia, you know, does this, these issues, do they really um, um, impact our bottom line? I must, I, I have to say, maybe the second one would be, you know, just the icing on, on the cake. Should everyone aspire uh, to be a leader and what are the implications if you don't does that mean that uh, you are a failure thank you very much thank you very much uh, ambassador uh that's a great question i'll begin with the last question that should everyone ask about to be a leader yes but can we all be leaders no we all cannot be leaders but i can submit to you that every quality of a good follower is the same as of a leader so if we have great followership who are critical friends who will tell the leader that you no know, you're wrong in this or you're wrong in that it helps a lot one thing i've seen in leadership is that if you surround yourself with mediocre people people who will come and just support your ideas there'll be a time you'll be in isolation because you are as strong as a leader as the people around you yeah if you see a leader struggling it's just the people close to that leader mm -hmm. so if your inner circle is weak and they all applaud you and they're afraid of you and they endorse you because of their daily bread, then the 
final people, the ultimate people who got you there are going to suffer. Because then they block even people words of wisdom that will tell you that you are on the wrong path. So yes, we should all aspire to believe that. But I can submit to you that followership is the, the requirement of followership the same as leadership. So there's nothing wrong being a follower because you cannot equally contribute to the greatness of a country. You don't have to be in the helm of affairs as a leader to contribute. And the beauty of democracy, people should voice freely what is going wrong in the community so that we fix it. Now, having said that, I believe so that in the end, what we are, the people we have become, is to a great extent the result of our choices, past and present. So, mm -hmm. of choices that we've made, especially when you talk about this functional system, is the choices we've made that has not helped us. How do we fix? Obama talked about that. How do we fix our system so that they can work? How do we fix civil service so that people can work? You don't just go to work, read newspapers, uh, sign some two, three, you know, uh, signatures, and then you're done for the day. So if that is not working, can we make a way that our civil service will be uh, on wages, not on salaries, so that the number of hours productivity you produce, that will pay you. That decision should come from the leaders to see when we've had civil service that's not working for us. They just go and sit there. Even common painting of the building is a problem. You see, so how are we fixing that all? Are we closing an eye to it that we don't see it? Now look at the gutters we have in our roads. Do we need gutters? Because if you come to the West, they don't have gutters, but they are building beautiful roads and it's lasting forever. Why are we doing shoddy work? So if the system is not functioning, and my brother, you cannot have any private goods without a good public good system. There has never been any country that has developed without a good public road public transportation system, public universities, public um, schools, you know, primary schools, middle school, high schools, and then we're talking about public parks and all these things. These things are so huge in investment that private companies cannot do it. But if those school system, road system, uh, hospital system are good, then you can have a private sector that can build on it. So when we talk about the public sector, it's the government in power that does that. How are people holding them accountable to make sure that they do those things? I think that is not there. You talked about racism and tribalism. I can tell you that tribalism is more dangerous than racism. You know, because racism, you're talking about somebody who don't look like you or talk like you. But in tribalism, the person look like you or do everything like you, just that you don't speak the same language. You are all Kenyans. You are all Ghanaians. You are all Ivorians. You are all Senegalese. Just that you speak one, let's say Wolof, that I don't speak that, doesn't make that you better than me. And then we look at our past and past wars that, oh, our forefathers fought this war and they won. Just because of that in this 21st century, you are better than somebody. You see, so most people thinking have been twisted in such a way that culturally we are deficient in thinking that because I belong to this tribe, I'm better than another person. No, you are all Kenyans, you are all Ghanaians, you are all, so no matter your tribe, when you're traveling, your passport says you are a Kenyan, you are a Ghanaian, you are a warrior, you are a Senegalese. Let's hold on to that. Don't allow politicians to divide us because for politicians, it's about the numbers. They think that when they divide you, they get the numbers and it keep them in power to be more corrupt. So let's look at that and fix it. And then the confidence in ourselves. One thing I always tell my people, it's not even in, in Africa, no, in, in the outside world, I know. When I come to Ghana, I also do some training for journalists in Ghana. And one thing I find is that you'll be standing in front of somebody, a journalist, and ask them a question. And the response they give to you, you cannot even hear it. They don't have confidence. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, a journalist, you don't have confidence. To hear so they, they will tell me, you know, because of our culture, if you don't ask questions well. And I told them that when I was in, in radio, I was doing a morning show host. And one time, a former president of Ghana, Professor Mills, came to me. I was at church one Saturday when they came for me, the military kid that was the president is in Koforidia. That's where I came from, the Eastern region. We had Eastern FM that I was a morning show host. And then that he's in town, they want me to ask him questions. And the first thing I saw that they had questions. The president had prepared his own question that he gave to me. And friendly, I told him that, sir, if you have your own questions, then you don't need me. And then he said, <laughs> That I'm going to ask you a question that every Ghanaian on the floor is asking. It's not going to be any special. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'm going to ask you any question that I will ask myself. And then those who feel said, no, but we have our questions. Well, if you have your question, then I'm not interviewing him. In the end, they agreed that I asked my question. Now, you know what? The interview went so well that he was so glad. Mm -hmm. Why? 
So we all have free mind to ask questions and free mind to answer. So we should be bold to do that because mm -hmm. the end is going to help us very much. Now, the last question that you talked about was the culture of lack of ambition. Yes, you have to be ambitious yourself. I met Bill Gates uh, in Seattle. And one thing he told me was that he was in class third grade. And, and you know, a visiting instructor came there. In America, we have instant visiting people that we can invite somebody to visit in a classroom and then motivate the students. So third grade student, I think he was like nine years. And then somebody came there and said that you can be wherever you want to be, even if you want to be the richest person in the world. And in saying that, even if you want to be the richest person in the world, he was so close to that person, the person touched him on the shoulder. So he said on that day, it dawned on him that he could be the richest person in the world. And of course, he became until Elon Musk and um, Jeff Bezos have taken over from him. So what it means is that whatever you believe in, you can be in. And you always as a leader have to motivate your people, tell them that they can be whoever they want to be. You have to inspire them to build that kind of confidence. But if you are threatening them, you don't want the media to talk, you don't want people. So you bring fear to the whole country. And when you do that, everybody will crawl on their shelves and you will not get the best out of them. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, please allow me to just give you uh, two questions that I've received from the floor, and I will just give, uh, read them. I am conscious of time, but nonetheless, allow me to just um, uh, share with you. And one is from uh, also one of the Salt Institute um, management, um, Dr. Tanko, who uh, poses uh, that according to your own experience, Prof, what are the main challenges in implementing the concept of thinking globally and acting local? And the second question uh, comes from a registrar who acknowledges or rather um, underlines the fact that indeed uh, students should be, uh, should be able to evaluate their instructors as they progress with the, with the course and not necessarily at the end. So the question, uh, here goes the question, how do we reform our democratic political systems in Africa so we don't wait for the end of a political party's tenure to evaluate their performance, but can make decisive evaluations that could cause politicians to perform better during the tenure and not at the end. So Prof, if you would kindly uh, take on these two questions, uh, I would truly appreciate, and then we will wrap up um, shortly after you answer the questions. Thank you. Thank you. The first question is uh, the challenges I've seen in thinking uh, global and acting local. I've never seen any challenge on that. In, in, in America, in Europe, in all my travels, uh, every state, every region, every district that you go have their own local problems. Some could be crime, some could be lack of jobs, some could be agriculture, lack of raw materials. But what they do is that you learn. So every university even have their own culture. What is that you learn and then find a way to solve that locality that you had your problems there. And I'm solving my problem, you're solving your problem. Nationally, we bring it together with all of the country's problems. That's what happens. Nigeria is doing this thing that in their budget now, they are not doing like a national budget. They are doing state budgets. So in Ghana, they can do regional budgets that every region will have their budgets, you know, about regional expenditure. Instead of everything centralized coming from the national, that this is your budget and this is what you can do. So every region will look at the resources you are bringing in expenditure and see how we can bridge the gap. So I think that in all that I've seen, there are no problems in thinking global because we look at a global trend. Our problems are always local. And how do you use the global knowledge to solve the local problem so that in the end, you solving your problem, I'm solving my problem, and then the nationally, we solve all our problems. Because the problems in Accra or Mombasa can be different from a village, the problem there, right? Some of the villages, they need a shed to do a funeral. That's their problem. <coughs> Sorry. And some of these places, they need just a, a boot, you know, long boot to go to the farms. So their problems are different. You cannot generalize it. It's just like generalizing things and thinking about going local, thinking local and then global and then solving global problems. It's just like you, you clustering people that all females are like this, all males are like that. It doesn't work that way. People are people. Some are good, some are bad, some are in the middle there. That's how we solve problems in thinking global, but we solve local problems. Then he asked another question about, was it about evaluating institutions? Exactly. Okay. Yes. So how do you evaluate the effect in the institution? The people know, even a 
you know, people who have never been to school can distinguish between a good leader and a bad leader. We know them. And leadership is so common that even in the animal world, God made leaders. So the best dancing bee is the best leader in the bee family. We have the wise elephant. When you see ants going, there's a leader there. So everywhere, when do you know that when you are even cutting a wood, you know, a tree, the trees speak to the other trees, flow to them with the roots. That's how nature, God has made the world, that we speak to Esau, build relationship, and then their leadership everywhere. So in order to evaluate the institutions, why don't we do it like Americans are doing it? They have midterm elections. They don't wait till the four years before they do presidential and parliamentary elections. Sometimes they do the parliamentary elections two years before the presidential elections. Why? Because they have seen that you link the presidential election to the parliamentary elections. The president who is popular, his party will win more of the vote. So let's bring one to the middle of it as a midterm election. That time, nobody's running for president and see who is popular there. So I think that in, when the economy is hard and things are not going well, and you do midterm election for parliamentarians, yes, the government in power might lose a lot of people in parliament. Why? Because it tells them that their policies are not popular. And then they might change it before their end of four years. So we should be looking at some of these alternative ways of doing things so that we can evaluate them before the end of the four years. Excellent, Prof. And uh, this is not all rocket science. It's happening some in, in, some, in some other parts of the world. So indeed, this can happen in, in our continent as well. Thank you so much for responding to, to all those questions. But before um, I, can, I can just uh, wind this up, I would like to give the floor now to Ambassador Kojo Alabo. Um, would you kindly um, unmute yourself? And uh, I believe he has some comment uh, towards that. Ambassador, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Excellent uh, moderation and uh, an even greater impact that Prof, you have brought to bear upon uh, your audience today. As usual, you've, you've taken, tackled your topic with passion, but it's passion that is underpinned by science. You're giving us so much to chew upon. And uh, what I, I always like about your lectures you know, is that uh, you always challenge your audience to think and think outside of the box, which is very important for us in Africa here, you know, that uh, we must learn to, to ask questions. We must learn to question things, see things that are, 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 have been, we have been handling for years decades, even, even centuries, you know, I always uh, wonder how, you know, in this time, mm. they are still pounding fufu like our people used to do from time immemorial. <laughs> you know, and that's, not, that's just because we're not, even our scientists are not thinking outside the box, are not thinking yes. about how to improve uh, the system, how to improve uh, uh, the, if you call it culture, culture also needs to be improved. You know, bad aspects of the culture must be weeded out and new ones must be inculcated. You know, so I know that you you live what you say and you say what you live, you know, and the experiences that you have, that's what you share with us. And that is why it is always, always intriguing, I must say, and very, very fulfilling listening to you. And today I, I can say that you have not been a disappointment at all. As you have been on top of your your topic, your, on top of your, uh, uh, the entire spectrum of global leadership. You've told us everything that we need to do. And I want to uh, challenge our, our, our students to know that, yeah, there's more to learn. And when we have a, a, a someone like Prof coming to spend some two hours with us, we must consider it a, a great privilege you know, he is sought after all over the place and he has spent his time, done his research and given it all to us. And uh, even more so, he's leaving even the slides with us. So Prof, I'm not supposed to be the, the one giving the vote of thanks, but I must say that, you know, I'm really, we are really indebted <laughs> to you. <laughs> Thank you, so Thank you much very much, Excellency. Uh, uh, lecture so lecture much. So much. We are taking home so much and thank you very much. And thank you, Catherine, for doing a good job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And indeed, um, I, I can echo also from the chat functions that it's, it's it has been two hours of learning and learning. And uh, 
we don't want to leave. I see nobody has left uh, uh, because normally we should have closed six minutes ago, but people are waiting to still listen if there's more. But um, indeed, we, we truly appreciate and um, I would like to um, give, uh, not to even talk anymore, but to give the floor to one of the students to, to express the gratitude that we as students, the participants, as well as the SALT uh, Institute Management has to, to offer for dedicating your two hours to just you know uh, share all the wisdom and the wealth of experience that you have. It's, it's truly appreciated. And I see Habat has given some comments on the chat function. Uh, and I would like now to uh, I acknowledge those comments, uh, just echoing the appreciation that uh, we, we, we as students and, and uh, the, the whole participants are having. But um, still um, to give somebody else the, the floor to just uh, say what I'm saying in a different uh, in different words and in, in a different um, uh, voice, I would like Herbert to kindly take the floor and, and just appreciate our our speaker. Herbert, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Catherine for the uh, singular honor. Um, I believe that these uh, guest seminars that we've been having bi-weekly, it's uh, really opening our minds to uh, a lot of things. And uh, as um, my uh, able uh, ambassador rightly said, we are all now thinking outside the box rather than thinking within the box. and. Uh, let me seize this opportunity to uh, bring an appreciation, first of all, to God, uh, through whom the wisdom to bring up this idea uh, of the guest seminar uh, came. And I must say that the timing uh, of these seminars has always been very right and very apt. And we need to thank God uh, for this. And I believe that we also need to thank God for uh, the uh, the board of uh, directors of SALT Institute and the management team uh, of the institute, the faculty, uh, who have also uh, been behind the scenes and have been pushing uh, this idea, uh, which is a, a blessing in itself uh, to us as an institute, and uh, I believe by extension to as many who join in uh, to listen. And I believe that they, they need to be highly, highly appreciated and commended for all their efforts. And of course, my uh, comrades uh, who are part of the coordinating team, I believe that we, we also need to appreciate you uh, for your good efforts. Uh, Catherine, who has been uh, doing so well with, with, with regards to the moderation and uh, a few of us who have also been running up and down, doing all the planning and, and, and stuff behind the scenes. I believe that we all need to be commended for all our efforts. And uh, it's only God who can bless us for uh, selfless labor of love. And of course, to our uh, guest speaker uh, for tonight, uh, Dr. Inki, it, it, it's indeed a blessing. It's indeed a honor to have you uh, uh, in this session. And indeed, it, 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 we've all been uh, blessed by the sessions. And true to what uh, Dr. Alabo said, uh, we've all been compelled to put our thinking caps on and begin to think global and act local. And I believe that this uh, topic will, will really take a lot of time to be digested and then uh, fully uh, put to, to, to good use. So we, we really appreciate you, sir, and from all of us, uh, faculty and students, uh, we say that may the Lord richly uh, bless you and may every virtue that has gone out of you uh, be replenished uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. I should also uh, finally appreciate my colleague students uh, who have also have been faithful in turning up uh, for the seminars, listening through uh, seminar after seminars, have meeting uh, very uh, great write-ups on each seminar. And uh, I want to really appreciate us uh, also because without our participation, uh, we will not be able to have uh, uh, the seminars uh, as, uh, as effective as it is. And so you also deserve a lot of uh, thanks. And on, on, on the whole, uh, God bless all of us uh, for making 
uh, this seminar a uh, great success. Thank you very much and see us in the next seminar uh, two weeks from today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Herbert. And indeed, uh, the, the seed that you've planted, Prof, has landed on fertile grounds. I can say uh, that in, in confidence, and I believe uh, it can be echoed by, by other students. And um, uh, just um, I would like to now welcome uh, Reverend Godwin to, to close us with a word of prayer. And um, before that, I just want to announce that um, for most of you, you have already seen the flyer for our public lecture, our annual public lecture. Uh, they have, we have started and um, please note already, uh, you can bear this uh, at the back of your mind or at least in your calendars that we have the public lecture uh, scheduled for this month, the 26th of, of March. And um, you will see, we will get to see the, the flyer circulating around. So the conversation doesn't st stop here. It doesn't end here. We continue in, in the next fortnight with the bi-weekly uh, uh, sessions of, of guest seminar series. And on top of that, we have the public lecture. We, we continue this, this conversation. So thank you all. And please, Reverend uh, Godwin, would you kindly unmute yourself and, and um, close us with a word of prayer? Uh, let us pray. Almighty God, we, we thank you so much for today's lecture. We thank you that um, every fortnight you give us wonderful lectures to broaden our understanding of global issues um, with a view to empowering us to serve your world, you know, in a way that will bring glory to your name. We thank you for today's lecture. We trust that we will apply the ideals of the lecture. Whatever lessons we have learned, we will put them into practice to ensure that as Africans, living in various parts of the world, we will unite in our thinking and collective spirit to ensure that we think global and also ensure that we do what we must do locally in our states to bring development to our people, to bring hope to our people, and eventually to put Africa on the, on the committee of developed nations. We will do this to the glory and we thank you for the vehicle that you have used for tonight's lecture. And we thank you for the Ministry of Salt Institute. We pray that you continue to bless us and make us great and strong. We bless you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you all. Prof, thank you so much. God bless you. And uh, we hope to hear from you again in a different forum. So have thank a nice uh, remaining part of the day. Thank you. Thank you. God bless us all. Amen.